I want to continue, I shouldn't say continue, I should say begin with our message this morning, and I want to welcome all of you to In Spirit. If you're visiting, not only do I want to say welcome home, but a special welcome um, to this series. This is the third week of our Love Does series of messages, and if you're unfamiliar with Love Does, uh, that's the title of a book, it's a New York Times bestseller, and it was written by Bob Goff. And what I like about Bob Goff is that he's not only funny, I mean, those of you who are reading the book, you, you, get a, you get a feel for how crazy Bob is. And if you're watching the videos, you get a much better feel for how Bob is. What I love most about Bob Goff is not just how real he is. And when you read the book, you see that. He's very transparent. What I really like about Bob Goff is that his whole intent in that series is for Christians to embrace the life that God wants for his people. Bob says, how to be extraordinary in an ordinary world. I think God has special things planned for his people, don't you? I don't think God wants Christians just to be ordinary and just blend in with the rest of the world. This is God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who made everything perfect in the very beginning and then gave it to his people. Now, I know we don't live in a perfect world, do we? (laughs) I look at the news this morning and I see uh, Christians who are suffering, Christians who are being persecuted, Christians who are having their heads cut off. And you saw that again this morning in the news. I look at the brokenness in our country. There's a a verdict that's going to come this week, most likely, in Ferguson. Um, And and all the racial tension and so forth that's you know, anticipated in this, in these decisions. And I look at them and say, how can we as God's people experience extraordinary when we live in a world that's so broken and seems to be so ordinary, huh? I just really believe that God wants his people, the God who created everything good, and not just good, but, you know, on the first day he created and it was good. On the second day it was good. It was great. Until... In the garden, it was broke. When I look at that, I think, well, how do we move from ordinary to extraordinary? And I think one of the ways that that happens is when you realize how much God loves you. I don't think we talk about that enough. We talk a lot about loving others, and we're going to talk about this morning. But you can't love others unless you really understand how much God loves you. I don't think we think about that very often, about how much God loves us. When I think about that, I think, okay, he created this world perfect and gave it to his people. And I know we sinned, didn't we? We sinned and the world became a broken place. Man broke that perfection, didn't he and she? There was disobedience. And there was sin. And the result was man would die, right? From that point on, man would die. What if God would have left us there? Hopeless and helpless. But he didn't. He loved us that much that he wanted to do something about it. I think he went to an extreme. He didn't just save us from sin, but I think he saved us from ourselves sometimes. Do you ever think about that? You kind of need to be saved from yourself. Because if we were left on our own, I think we'd self-destruct. God came to save us and to save ourselves. So in his place, if you think about this, he sent his one and only son, right? To die. What kind of God would do that? A God who is crazy in love with you. A God who said, I can't leave these people here. I'm going to pay the ultimate price. I'm going to take care of this and I'm going to send my son. That's extreme, isn't it? That's extraordinary. That's a crazy kind of love. And he did that for you and I. But we sometimes think it's stopped there. That's really just a piece of it, isn't it? He created, we blew it, He sent his son, and it doesn't end there. It keeps flowing, doesn't it? I don't know how often you think about that. I know that many of you grew up singing the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And we sing songs about God is love. 
But do we really think about how much God loves us? Do we really think about how much his love just continues to flow? I want us to hang on to that word flow this morning. If you notice, that was a word that was used different times in the praise team in their songs about God's love that flows. Here's where I'm going with this this morning. God loves us so much that he continues to just lavish that love. It just continues to flow into his people. It's not what he did or what he's doing, but for those who are in Christ, it's what he's going to do in heaven as well, right? This is a lifelong journey where his love just continues to flow. One of my questions this morning is, what happens if that love stops flowing? God's love isn't going to stop flowing. So God's love is flowing into us, and we're supposed to let it flow to others, right? I want us to think about that this morning. What happens if the love stops flowing? In my thinking about this this past week, a couple of pictures came to mind. And one is a rain barrel. How many of you have seen a rain barrel like that? Maybe some of you have a rain barrel like that. Water continues to pour into that barrel. And is it supposed to stay in that barrel? No, it's supposed to flow out, right? It's supposed to flow out so that it becomes food or life for something else, right? Well, what happens if that, lo- or if that water stops flowing? What happens if that bucket's full and nothing comes out? It gets pretty stale, doesn't it? It doesn't become good for anything that's supposed to flow out of it. And the water inside of it just kind of gets contaminated and gross and all green and yucky and everything else and nothing else can go into it. You might just say it's full of itself. And it doesn't do anybody else any good, does it? You see a lot of them that are, when you, when you travel abroad um, in places where they don't have fresh water supplies, they put a cistern like that up on the roof. And it catches the water, and it eventually it's used to make, provide life for other things, provide life for people. But what happens if it never gets out of there? It turns bad, doesn't it? I think that sometimes Christians can be like that. We can be like the barrel or the cistern. God fills us up, but if we don't let it out, we just can kind of become complacent, maybe even stale ourselves, and we don't bring a whole lot of life to other things around us. Here's another question this morning. What if we stop or withhold God's love from flowing through us? What if we're the cistern? Aren't we vessels, containers? Paul talks about jars of clay, clay pots, supposed to come in and go out of us. But what happens if we don't let it out? What happens if we hold back? You ever think it's easy to get stale as a Christian? Kind of forget about how much God loves us or how much he wants us to look after other people because after all, we got enough things of our own to take care of, much less everyone else. But I think what happens sometimes is we choke out, and listen to me this morning, we choke out our own lives because God wants us to give that life to someone else. We can't be filled with fresh water if we don't let the other water out, can we? I want you to listen to this text this morning because I think the text brings up what I want to say in the first part of this service. Listen to this text from 1 John 4, 7 through 12. And I want you to get the picture of God filling us and us leaking that out, spilling that out to others. Here's what it says, and I'm reading from the message this morning. It says, My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Do you get a picture of God filling us there? But listen to what he says. Let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. You get the picture of God filling us and supposed to go out? Okay, then listen. It says, everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. Ah, so this is about a relationship, isn't it? The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love him. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his son, his only son, into the world so we might live through him. Again, God's sending, we have life through him. 
It says, this is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear the way, clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. Then he says, my dear, dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete in us. And I'm going to unpack this. And then he says it's a perfect love. I want to start out this morning by sharing two truths about God's love. And you need these as a reminder. We all need to be reminded of this. And I think this is especially important going into Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, a season that's all about loving others. Number one, God's love is audacious. God's love is audacious. God is crazy in love with you. I don't know how often you think about that, but God wants to have a relationship with you. I read something this past week, and it said, if God isn't answering your prayers, be thankful you got to spend time with him. God wants a relationship with us no matter what's going on. He wants us to spend time with him. He's crazy about us. That's why in the text it says, God sent his son into the world so that we might live. Live now and live eternally. It's not what he just did, but what he's doing and what he's doing forever. When I think about God's love and how it continues to flow, just think with me on this. God said he will always be with us. I don't care where you find yourself in life. He says, I will never leave you or... Do you ever feel like God maybe left you or like, where are you, God? Still a relationship, isn't it? And he says, I'll never leave you. That's his promise. I love you that much that I will never leave you. What about when we blow it? There's not, a, there's not a day that goes by that I don't blow it somehow. Probably blow it before I get out of bed in the morning. And God says, I'm going to give you a second chance. God loves us enough to always give us a second chance. How about the way he provides for all our needs? I'm amazed at how God continues to provide all our needs. I love that song by David Crowder, and we didn't sing it this morning, but it's how he loves us like a hurricane. You ever think about that? God just loves us like a hurricane. He's just like a storm that just sends his love on us. You can't escape it if you're in it. If you're in it. He loves us that much. That's an audacious kind of love. Webster defines, both, defines audacious as bold or surprising or shocking. You know what? God is jealous for you, not of you. If you know your Old Testament, it talks often about we have a jealous God. That's jealousy in a good way. He's jealous for us, not of us. He's jealous for us to have the kind of life he wants for us, and nothing less than his best. I like what Philip Yancey says. Philip Yancey's a preacher, author, writer. He says, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you could do to make him love you less. That's his design. And his purpose for us is that we share that love with others. That's the second part of it. Number one, you've got to be aware of God's love. You've got to know how much God loves you. And then number two, we're to love others like God loved us. We're to love on them like a hurricane. We're to step into people's life in a way that doesn't look like the world. It doesn't look ordinary. We're to step in in ways that are extraordinary. And I'll share some examples with you. But first, let me share why I say this, because it comes straight out of John 13, 34. It says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. How on earth can we love others like God loves us? Do you ever think about that? How can we begin to love others like God loved us? That's the command. If that's the standard we're going to be held to, how on earth do we do that? How do we love in a bold, surprising, shockingly audacious way? Let me give you several things this morning, and I encourage you to write these down and think about these and practice them over the course of the next month and a half as we enter the holidays. First of all, audacious love requires filling. 
if you don't fill up your car once in a while, how far would you get? Not very far, would you? If you don't put money in your checking account, you might have blank checks in your checkbook, but they're not going to go too far if you don't put money in that account. If you don't stop and eat three meals a day, how do you expect to stay healthy and strong and go to work? If you don't spend time with God, devotions, reading, Christian books, life groups, church, prayer, how do you expect to give away what he, you aren't getting yourself? You can't give away what you don't have. Audacious love requires filling. Listen to these words from Ephesians 3, 16 through 20. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner, be in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being established and rooted in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be, you see that? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Romans 15, 13. Here's why this is so important. It says, may the God of hope, say it, fill you, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Why? so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We could talk about this for a long time, but it's a personal thing. You've got to think about this. If you're to love audaciously, you've got to be filled up. You can't give what you don't have. See, we've got to be filled up, and the Bible says that. If we're filled up, then what do we do with it? Number two, audacious love requires that I just put in there spilling. I don't want to say trickle out, but Spilling. Just like when somebody knocks over a whole pitcher or something on the kitchen table and it flows everywhere and everybody's affected by it. We need to do the same thing with our love. We're supposed to spill it up. So fill it up, fill it up and let it overflow. So fill it up, fill it up and let it overflow. Right? You know that song? It's not just a song. That's a lifestyle that Christ wants for his people. Isn't that what Jesus did? He spent quiet time with his father so that he could go out and do more ministry and it spilled out to everybody around him. When Jesus was around, you knew it. People loved him. People hated him. Guess what? We're going to do the same thing. Some people are going to love you. Some people are going to think you're nuts. Why would anybody go to that extreme? Why? Because we're blessed to be a blessing. We're supposed to be filled up and we're supposed to let it out and overflow. Let it spill out. Look at the Bible text for what happens when we do that. Luke 6, 38. It says, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make more room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. If you're not giving love away, you don't have any room to take in God's love either. Filling and spilling. Make room for more. Okay? Number three, audacious love responds to opportunities. And these are where the challenges come in. It responds to opportunities. How many times doesn't somebody come to you and say, could you do this or could you do that? What's our answer quite often? I'll think about it. All right, what are they going to get out of this? What do they want from me? What do they really want? There's a hidden story. There's got to be something here. There's more to it than just that. But it looks for opportunities. When opportunity arises, I, I like this. I'm not going to spill the whole story because those of you who are doing the video are going to get an interesting one today. But Bob Goff gives a story. Bob Goff lives in a really interesting place. And he's got water. he lives on the water, but he's got a pathway that goes past his house. And one day there was a young man who came to his house and approached him and said, hey, can I ask you, can I do this? Now, I'm not trying to tease you with this, but I don't want to blow the story, okay, for those who are doing the video. But he says, could I do this at your house? And Bob's thinking, seriously? He's like, sure, why not? The guy was all excited and he goes and he tells his girlfriend, 
that he's going to, you know, he's going to surprise us. So he tells his friends that this is what he's going to do with his girlfriend at this house. Next thing you know, he's thinking, well, if the guy said yes to that, maybe he'll say yes to something else. So he goes back and he asks him again. He says, hey, now can I do this at your house? And Bob's thinking about it. He says, sure, why not? He goes, we'll even do that for you. The kid is shocked. So he tells his friends, this is what's going to happen. Next thing you know, a day or so later, the kid comes bouncing down the road or the pathway and he says to Bob, do you have a boat? I'm giving a little bit away. Bob says, yeah, I got a boat. He says, well, do you think... Now put yourself in your shoes. What's this guy after? When is this going to end? How much am I going to have to give this guy? And what's going to happen ultimately? And Bob says, yeah, I got a boat. Well, do you think I could? And Bob says, sure. Sure you can. And he left and Bob did one better. Bob went and he called the Coast Guard and he set up a whole scenario. And this kid on the day when all of this happened was just flabbergasted at what Bob did for him, this person who he never knew. And I thought, what if we responded that way sometimes when opportunities come our way? When somebody wants us to do something or they give us the opportunity to do something, how do we respond to that? We might say yes, but when we go overboard and say, you know what, you're asking for 50 and I'm giving you 100. Or you're asking for this and I'll give you the whole works. We don't always do that, do we? See, it takes an opportunity. It responds to opportunities when they're there. Looks for opportunities. Number three is response to opportunities. The reality in that story is it's not about the young man. It's not about Bob, but it's about God. It's about God, how God pursues us and keeps wanting to give us more. Number four is it looks for opportunities. Don't just wait for opportunities to come to you. It's Christmas. All around you are people who have all kinds of needs, aren't there? Maybe this year for Christmas, maybe your family ought to adopt somebody or participate in an organization and just go overboard. Just blow them out of the water and do something audacious. Do something bold, surprising, or shocking. I love what the students at Indiana Wesleyan University did probably four or five weeks ago. And you might have seen this on the national news because it made the news, it made the papers and everything else. But on a Wednesday morning for their chapel, I think they have about 2,000 kids that come to chapel on Wednesday morning. And it was a 10 o'clock service. And the president got up there at the beginning of the, it was the president of student housing, got up in the beginning of the service and he said, you know what, kids, students, we're going to do something different today. He said, this chapel is going to be like none other. He said, what I want you to do is, he said, I want you to take out a note. And he said, we're going to bless somebody. We're just going to bless somebody. He took this off from Andy Stanley did this. Andy Stanley says, bless one person in a way that you could bless everybody. So he said, we're going to take out a note of paper. And he says, I want you to thank a person. Just put on there, thank you for the work you're doing We love you, we appreciate you, we know you don't get a lot of thanks, but thank you for this. And then he said, and we're going to pass around a collection plate. And he said, you put in there whatever you want. And he says, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to call Domino's Pizza at 10 o'clock in the morning. And we're going to order two pizzas. Now, don't anybody tell the pizza driver. But the pizza driver comes in at 1030 with two pizzas to a chapel filled with 2,000 students. And the guy came in and thought, what am I doing? And the guy on the stage, the president said, I'll bring them down here. He said, I'm waiting for those. So the guy came down, they put him on the stage and he handed him the two pizzas and he said, we have something for you. He handed him a bag full of notes from 2,000 kids and a tip for $1,268. The guy melted. And the guy said, you know what? This year I'm going to be able to have Christmas with my two kids. What a cool way of an audacious audacious way of loving somebody. Do for somebody what you'd like to do for everybody. Well, where do you start with that? Maybe you've got somebody at work. Maybe you've got somebody at school. Maybe your school needs to do something. Maybe your class needs to do something. Maybe your family needs to do something. Maybe the church needs to do something. Our groups are doing that. 
Number five, you got to be willing to take a risk. Audacious love requires a risk. Sometimes I think when we try to bless people, we might have a little motive in it, or we might think, well, how are we going to benefit from it? What if they couldn't give us a thing back? That's a true gift, isn't it? When you give something to somebody that they could never repay you for. But you got to be willing to take a risk. How many of you ever got burned? Let's be honest. What happens when we get burned? We tend to get scarred, don't we? And we tend to hold back, and we think, I'm not going to get burned again. Sometimes we do things for people, and we get hurt. We get hurt, and we want to write them off. But you know what happens when we do that? If we let love, if we stop love from flowing, we'll never take a chance to be willing to be loved again. What if Jesus would have loved us based on what we might have given in return? There's many ways, many different ways that we're to go in love like that. Takes me to number six, love doesn't keep score. Audacious love does not keep score. I like, I like what Bob Goff says here. He says, when we close off the possibility of loving others, we close off our capacity to be loved by God. Listen to these words in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. It says, love is patient. Ouch. I confessed Friday night in the middle of my living room to another couple that I am not patient. My wife, if she's in here, she's in the kids' room, but she'd say amen. When you put me in a car that broke and then it misfired without a map in a foreign country and it's hot and sticky and no food, you know what happens to me when I don't eat? I'm not very patient. I think we all get that way sometimes. We get impatient when we're loving because we want results and sometimes we look at it more, what's in it for us? It says love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. Boy, that's a good one at Christmas time. I'll love you if you love me, I love you, you love me. We're a happy family, right? Doesn't work that way. I don't know all these songs are coming from this morning, reliving my childhood, but... We tend to do that, don't we? We think, well, if I love them, they'll love me back. What if we just loved and didn't expect anything back? It says it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I guess that's maybe a challenge for you this Christmas too. Erase the board when it comes to records of wrongs because Christ erased the board for us. Keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil, it rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes. And it always perseveres, it keeps going. There's one more point, and it comes straight out of our text that I read at the beginning from John 4. Audacious love completes us. It completes us. Listen to these words again. It says, my dear friend, if God loved us like this, we, are to certainly, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God, ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete. See, if we don't love, we're not complete, are we? If we just take it in and we don't let it out, we're going to get stale. The cistern is going to stink. The other piece of that, when it comes to completion... Other people don't see Christ loving us if we don't let it out. He taught us and commanded us to love. Listen to these words from John 13 again. It says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. And here's the, here's the reason why. It says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. See, it's really not about us, is it? Our love and our capacity to love other people is what other people see. They're judging Christians. I said that a couple weeks ago. People judge us. 
by how we maybe judge them or what we do or don't do for them. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And it brings together that full expression. Our love is made complete when we let it flow, fill it up, and let it overflow. The bottom line, we're to love. Just as Jesus loved us. This is nothing new. He isn't telling us anything. We don't already know. That's okay. I'm just trying to get you to do it. That's your part. To do as we've been commanded. Why? Because the world is watching. The world is watching. The world is waiting. They're testing us. They're judging us by how we love them or don't love them. Here's my challenge. And it's very simple this morning. Love like Jesus. You may think, well, that's a really deep message. No, it's a complicated message. Because how do you love like Jesus? We all know that. How do you really love like Jesus? A love that takes it in, filled up, and overflows. That's what love does unconditionally. I'm so glad that God loves me where I'm at. And I'm so glad He doesn't judge me for all the mistakes I made, but that He gives me another chance. I'm so glad that He doesn't stop loving me when I stop loving Him or mess up. I'm so glad that He puts people in my life, that's what I'm thankful for, for the people who come alongside of me and encourage me. The people that just step in. That's what love does. That's what I'm asking you to do. Love like Jesus. A love that does. Not complicated, but hard to do. But when you're filled up, you got to let it overflow. My prayer is that you'll do that like never before. That you'll respond to opportunities, that you'll seek opportunities, and that you'll love without limits. Maybe especially love those who are finding a difficult time feeling loved. Especially reaching out to those who have a difficult time in life, dealing with whatever is going on in their life. Anybody know anybody that's dealing with anything in their life? I'll give you a list to go out and love. They're right around you. They're sitting in front of you and back of you, next to you. We all need to be loved, don't we? We all need to be appreciated. I think the best gift we can give is is priceless. You can't put a price tag on love. Jesus, God gave his son. That's a huge price to pay. He's just telling us, fill yourselves up and let it out. And don't just let it leak out. I don't like leaks. Spill it out. Spill it out and let it overflow. You'll see a different world. You'll see people in a way that you've never experienced people. You'll give love. You'll receive love. And God says when we do that, it completes us. I don't know about you, but I want to be complete. You've heard me say this before. I don't want to go to my grave with the song still in my heart. I want to go to my grave singing the last note. Because that's what love does. It never ends. It never keeps score. Love perseveres. You want three words to take with you? Really make it simple? Love like Christ. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning for this reminder to us. Really simple words. But we need to be challenged because we don't always do a very good job of loving like you loved us. And the way that you still love us. Lord, may we look around this year for opportunities to love like you love. Bold, audacious, surprising, crazy love. May you just give us opportunities and may we seek opportunities to love like you did. 
Lord, give us grace, give us strength, give us wisdom for whatever it is you call us to. Just use us to be a blessing. We just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.